Okay, so right now I hope everybody is in and everybody is ready. So we are ready to start. So let me introduce you to Triathlon Fall Fest. And first of all, all our speakers who are ready to talk to you and introduce you their own topics. So we have uh, Clara Cherna from Rovi. It's an organizing company of this all Triathlon Fall Fest. Hello, Clara. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Great to have you here. Thank you very much for organizing this webinar. Then uh, we have uh, Peter Wabroszek, uh, the multi triathlon champion from Czech Republic. Hi, Peter. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Uh, representing best side, Markus Nussbaum, CEO, founder, head of athlete development. Hi, Markus. Thank you for joining us. Hello, it all. I wish you had enjoyed the Triathlon Fall Fest so far. We will certainly enjoy your speech and enjoy your topics. Representing Body Rocket, Eric de Gaulier, CEO of its company. Hi, Eric. Hi, great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, looking forward to hear of you. Ebus and uh, Martin Beckelmann, Senior Manager Sponsorship and Sports Marketing. Hi, Martin. Yeah, hi, Clara. Hi, Tomas. Hi to the audience. Hi. Thank you for joining us. Zone 3, Scott Hilster, triathlon coach. Hello to you, Scott, as well. Hi there, Thomas. Uh, hello, everyone. Good evening, afternoon, and maybe good morning to some of you. Uh, we'll catch you soon. Awesome. Everything is working. Everybody is ready. So let's start. So actually, what does it mean to triathlon fall fest with Ruby in the online environment? It's a unique online event, uh, which gives both experienced athletes and the newbies the chance to train, compete and learn with some of the best professional triathletes in the world. Together with our partner, especially Challenge Family, we have a full program of riders. You can see here uh some videos we will have some videos to cover our speeches uh, which makes it i hope more attractive to you this webinar is definitely not the only section not the only part of the whole fall fest uh, that's why it is called fast because it has all started in the previous days let me pick up some interesting points on thursday 24th november uh, there were uh Current Challenge Wanaka champion Kyle Smith and Frederick Funk, along with Peter Babroshek, uh, during the uh, Challenge Wanaka course with all of you. And today uh, you could ride with Simona Krivankova on the famous route in Almere with the group ride. Now we are starting a webinar, which is called Getting Ready for Your Race. It's going to be a live panel discussion with the speakers I have introduced before. Uh, the important thing for you guys listening to us from all over the world that uh, everybody gets uh, its time, probably 10 minutes or something like that and in the end there will be a discussion so you can use the q a section in the lower section of the zoom application or zoom program on or zoom browser so don't forget to ask your questions everybody will stay online for the entire webinar and every speaker is ready to answer your questions uh when the official part of the webinar is over uh what about tomorrow at uh, uh 6 uh, p.m um no, just today, 6 p.m. UTC, there's a group ride, uh, Challenge Shamorin with Andrzej Kubo, uh, experienced uh, native Slovak. Uh, Andrzej Kubo will share local tips uh, about the championships in Shamorin. And tomorrow we will have uh, the peak of the program. I would say it's a challenge road with Magnus Ditlev and other pros. You can watch the stream about uh, 90 minutes long program. We are getting ready for you. So that's what it means uh, the whole triathlon fall fest. And now let me introduce you briefly the Rovi company. It's a real and fun cycling uh, 
experience which provides a ruby and you can enjoy it from your home in just a few clicks uh, it's a global indoor cycling platform for athletes where everybody can compete ride with friends for fun and exercise and do much more more about ruby we will hear from clara cherna i have introduced before key account manager ruby so clara tell us something about ruby please thank you Tomas. thank you uh, everyone uh i guess you have some experience with ruby already if not i think this triathlon for us is the unique unique opportunity how to how, how to try it on uh what's the what's the i would say the highlight of our company and as you can see uh, we are working with real routes so we have we are recording routes all over the world uh, which enables us either to bring in like some cycling highlights as Paso del Stervio for example so people can ride it uh, we are also bringing routes from real races. So it means when somebody is training, for example, for the race uh, for the next season, uh, you can do it online at your home. This is also the reason why we started cooperation with Challenge Family, who is the partner of this event. And currently we have over 20, 20 routes from all challenges around the world. So if you are planning to participate at some of them in 2023, you can train on Ruby. So this the realness and this this um, opportunity to to travel the world is I would say the highlight of Ruby and and something we are we are really enabling people to to do. Uh, we are Czech Czech based company at Czech Republic. We are on the market uh, several years. We are growing rapidly and uh, we are changing the features so that everybody can enjoy what, what you like on in the application. So uh, that's, I think, really in a nutshell about Ruby. Um, I think there is no, we will really rather talk to our partners who are, who are the most important here now. But uh, let me just invite you for tomorrow because it will be really cool race with, with uh, 11, 11 pro athletes. So unique opportunity to, to race with them and also to talk to them because we have a Zoom session before, before the race as well. So enjoy and thank you. Thank you, Clara. Awesome. Let me repeat the invitation for tomorrow. It's going to be really cool. We have a shining stars of World Triathlon. We will have a live studio uh, commenting the uh, date of Challenge Road. So really a uh, pleasure to be part of uh, this uh, broadcast. But today uh, it's a special time for the webinar and for our guest. And uh, let me introduce you briefly the first speaker of today's topic. And uh, the topic for following and coming minutes is approach to training. And we will discuss it with Peter Vabroshek. Who is it, Peter? I bet nobody here who doesn't know who is Peter. But let me briefly remind some of his great uh, peaks of his career uh, actually he is a reigning world champion in double ironman one in 2022 in uh, june in the united states united states uh, twice uh, winner of the world cup in long distance triathlon 2006 and 2011 81 times top 10 at the ironman ironman races 20 81 times, 21 times top 10 at the challenge races, three times champion of the races of the x ray series, the winner of the marathon and 100 kilometer long run in Arctica uh, 2013, uh, the winner of the marathon on the North Pole 2015 and so on and so on and so on. Peter, we are really happy to have you here and uh, we cannot wait to hear uh, from you about your tips and tricks uh, uh, about the approach to training. Uh, maybe a lot of uh, people following this webinar knows that you are one of a kind athlete who prefers much more racing than training and basically in the recent years uh, i hope i know you very well and i hope i'm not lying uh, if uh, i say that you are training during the races but this approach is really i would say not for everybody so how would like you to start your speech about approach to training. 
Yeah, thank you, Tom. Uh, the interaction was very long. Let's leave more time to talking. Actually, uh, uh, my approach of uh, uh, racing a lot and not training as much is just the result of uh, me being in the sport for close to 40 years now, uh, including first 10 years as a rower and then over 30 years in triathlon. I had, especially when I was at university with no family, uh, no kids, I had plenty of time to train. And uh, at that time, I was racing Olympic distance triathlon and I trained something between 30 and 35 hours a week. So uh, it's not that you would start doing triathlon and just race your way through the season for some uh, top results. You have to definitely spend several years of uh, structured, individually structured training. And then if you get to a certain level, you can actually start to train through races, but uh, under only condition that you rest properly between those races. So uh, when I got in, in the peak of, of this uh, way of doing it to uh, eight Ironman races in nine weekends through the summer, I basically done, that was what I've done through those nine weeks, nothing else. It was just maybe 30 minute easy swim or 30 minute spin on the bike between the races. And that was it. So for body having, you know, one very hard day and six days to properly recover, uh, it was just ideal scenario. And uh, the results were very actually getting better with uh, more races done this way. But uh, it would never be working if I wouldn't have many years of structured training behind me. Uh, and many short distance races, first of all. So uh, it's it's a, a really difficult to describe how people should train for triathlon in such a short time. So I would stay with uh, some basics. And uh, if anyone wants to ask something specific to his case, uh, please put the questions uh, to the bottom line of, of your Zoom, and we will do our best to answer at the end of, of the webinar. Uh, the first thing you're training, uh, the biggest mistake I see with uh, beginning and also some experienced triathletes is that you get used to some kind of structure because it fits your family, fits your working obligations. And then you happen to do the same thing uh, every week over and over again, uh, like 10 kilometer loop run at one pace on Monday, maybe some running intervals on Wednesday, long run on Sunday and so on so on with the swim and the bike. If you do the same thing over more than six to eight weeks, uh, your body will get used to it and uh, it will stay in its uh, progress. So first of all, make sure every few weeks uh, bring something new to your training sessions, uh, new motifs, new intervals, new lengths, new surface for running, um, change your uh, time trial bike for road bike or mountain bike, just make your training variable, bring new things to your body that it you make you have to make it adapt to new things. That's what uh, makes you stronger. And another big misconception for many of uh, athletes is uh, you never get stronger in any kind of training session. You always get stronger when you are actually resting and recovering from that session. That's the only time when you are getting stronger, when your body can uh, get a chance to repair and replenish and build itself stronger for next even harder session. Uh, so if you, if you really pile a lot of training sessions together and don't allow your body to absorb all the hard work, you won't be progressing. Uh, other thing... I'm trying to be quick here. Uh, don't forget it's triathlon. So regardless of which of the three disciplines is your strong point and which one is your weakness, always make sure to include all three disciplines into training, uh, especially even if you are a very strong swimmer, having swim at the end of the day makes you generally better rested after your hard running and, and cycling sessions because uh, swimming, if you know the technique properly, is kind of a hydro massage. Even if you swim hard, your legs are usually recovering from the uh, hard cycling and running. So I generally put uh, swimming as a last session of the day if that's uh, logistically possible. I know that a lot of people uh, love to swim early in the morning. The races start with the swim early in the morning. I had to do the same at university when I was swimming at 6 a.m. for two hours every day. 
but uh, it's not optimal. Uh, optimal is to use not only for improving your swim ability, but also for recovering from your bike and run. I can feel that I'm walking hardly to the pool in the evening. I'm always walking more fresh on the way back. So that, that would be uh, in very quick following uh, the basic uh, advice, uh, how to approach the training. Uh, I'm sorry we are running out of the time. I know that there are these speakers waiting to talk. So I, I leave it here. And if you have any specific questions, put, uh, put them into the note. Mm -hmm. Peter, thank you very much. Uh, let me ask you one question right now and the rest of questions we will keep for the Q&A session in the end, which I would like to remind one more time for everybody who is connected to this webinar. Uh, you have been talking about the importance of uh, the recovery of the resting. You have been talking about the importance of variety of the uh, training of the pushing yourself uh, what about the consistency because you are in the sports environment i would say 40 years so it's a really really long time but uh, uh, so from your perspective uh, how important it is to do all the stuff continuously and keep the consistency of the of the training yeah that's definitely very important it always beat any kind of super session you can you can beat the consistency with anything. Uh, your body needs to be constantly uh, challenged by new training sessions. And uh, if you want to improve, you need to bring new stuff and uh, do it continuously. Yeah, that's very important. And I didn't uh, mention that in, in my previous short speech. But uh, consistency definitely be beats everything. Uh, also for your improvement, uh, you have to build some kind of base to, to do some hard sessions. So if you are talking over here, let's start with the long rides, lot long flat rides before you attempt to go into some hard racing. Because uh, I know with some of my clients I'm training and uh, coaching and also with my own training, going into race always ends up uh, going all out. Because once you have all those people around you, you are trying just to beat anyone who is in your side, not to be beaten by the guys behind you or girls. So uh, before you approach uh, hard racing on Ruby, make sure to pick some nice uh, flattish courses. Uh, there's plenty of those you can filter it in, in the picker and uh, build a base for several weeks or even months if you are new to triathlon uh, before attempting uh, the hard sessions. And if you want to train long or hard, always keep in mind uh, to set your schedule for every single week through your season so that you can continue for following weeks. Not to do too much one week, like training camp in Mallorca, and then forget about the training when you come back. That doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one more time, I will remind the chance for all of you, everybody, to take part in the Q&A sec uh, session. In the end, I have just uh, checked the box and we already have uh, three questions in the Q&A section. So uh, let me encourage you to add more questions if you have, not only for Peter, but uh, for the other speakers as well. We will now move on a little bit. Uh, just a quick note that we will be back with Peter in the very final topic uh, of our webinar and we will discuss with Peter nutrition as a fourth discipline of triathlon so Peter will stay online with us of course not only for the Q&A section and session but as well for his another topic nutrition as a fourth discipline of triathlon so thank you Peter for now and we will now move to best type best site what is it actually best site this is your partner for sweat analysis your home your lab that's the motto that's uh, the goal of the company which enables you to make sweat tests at home and get knowledge about the sodium concentration of your sweat the sodium concentration milligrams per liter paired with your sweat loss liters per hour is the key information for the best possible hydration it guarantees the liquid balance in your body 
body and the glucose resorption in your gut make more out of your competition that's the uh, goal of the best site services and we will discuss it deeply with marcus nussbaum ceo founder and head of the athlete development marcus uh, hello again one more time we are happy to have you here hi thomas hi at all i as mentioned i hope you already enjoyed the triathlon fall fest from ruby and i'm yeah i'm really happy to give you some insights about the new technologies in in trading but what there is possible but um before that i want to uh, introduce our company it's, it's best site it's a a difficult word because it's a German word and it stands for um it stands for your personal best. So if you translate it in English, yeah, you see a stopwatch and the best side logo, it stands for your personal best. That's our approach for all of the athletes. So um our history began in before 2017, and we uh were already uh, the official diagnostic supplier of Ironman Europe last year. And we already started um, cooperation with the challenge family. So just to give you a short uh, overview, what we can offer for you. As um, Thomas introduced, we have um, one product which enables you to get your sodium concentration. This is important because uh, sodium has a very important role in our body. But before I will go into that, um, when you when you start um, your training, you always have an approach, like like Peter said. But before you have the approach, you will have a goal in next year. For example, challenge rod, and then you maybe struggle with training, or you you struggle with training zones. I I will not in person go deep into that because I think um, Eric will do that later on. Um, you have might have some topics with uh, recovery. And if you think about finishing and finishing a long distance race, you will have to think about your nutrition. Um, this topic will also be covered in, in the end, but these main parts you have to have in mind when you think about finishing uh, a long distance triathlon. On race day, latest on race day, uh, our belief is that you shall um, have to enter this in training as well. Latest on race day, you will have to answer the following questions. What do you have to drink? When, what and when do you have to eat? And when and how to pace your race? Um, with these questions, um, typically the athletes turning to a local uh, performance center. You can do um, a kind of performance assessment there where you uh, measure your lactate uh, samples or you do uh, a spiro ergometry with um, measurement of the, of the breath and then you will get a, a kind of metabolic profile in the local performance center and what we created in the last year for you is that you can have your home you can make your your smartwatch your garmin your smart device into your own performance assessment in combination with with the application we we have in combination with the sweat pack uh, Thomas mentioned and in combination creating a kind of sweat profile for example when you want to answer all the questions when to drink how to eat etc etc you will first have to know your individual for example your sweat rate to answer the question how to drink you have to know your individual carbohydrate grade um, combustion before answering the question what and when to eat and how to pace the race. And with this metabolic profile, you get in the end, you get the sweat profile and the sodium concentration out of the sweat pack. You have the main parts of the race nutrition. Just in general topic, um, how to deal with that? I, I think this will be answered later on. but. Before dealing with anything, our goal is that you have your individual values. You have to know your individual training zones, your carbohydrate combustion, et cetera, et cetera. And this is our approach for um, new technologies and training. So make the, the diagnostic services available for all the athletes out there, undependent from their localization. So you do not have to have a, 
a local performance center next to you to get the same result in the end. And we will provide you with test-based advices in training and on race day. And we can offer that over the iPhones with, with Apple, Google. And in the end, you, you only have to choose your race, for example, the challenge races, go into applications, choose challenge world. We use your um, performance assessments, your diagnostics uh, or the, the, the diagnostic results, and then we map all the data on the, on the racetrack to give you advices based on your individual data. So I'm happy to answering to answer all the questions which come up possibly, and then I will hand over to Thomas again. Thank you, Marcos. Excellent. Uh, when I first uh, listed the notes and the speakers of today's webinar, and I found out that uh, you are going to be here uh, with the best side and with the sweat analysis, I was kind of surprised that uh, something like that uh, really exists. I uh, Before that, I had no idea. And with all the abbreviations I have mentioned in the, your lead-in, it maybe looks uh, to somebody who is listening and watching us uh, like a, a complicated and scientific chemistry. So is it uh, really easy? to use and really everybody can do it uh, by himself yes yes of course it's uh, when we talk about the sweat pack this is the test kit for your sweat analysis with the, to analyze your sodium concentration which is uh, in one point responsible also for the energy uptake in your body so um it's easy to use you just put on the patch uh, go for training you can do it indoor outdoor wherever you want and then you can send in the sample um, of, of your sweat back to our lab. So we, typically this was done in, in performance labs um, yeah, on, on local side. And what we did is we reversed the order to put the lab to your home. And the same is true for the uh, performance assessment where you can get your uh, metabolic profile in the end. So you just have to connect um, the application you can go to the App Store of Apple and Google with your with your Garmin device, and based on the data we we get from a test protocol, you will be guided through. It's really easy. We can then answer the questions: when to eat, how to eat, how to pace the race based on the race track. So it's really easy. It's really easy to use, and I really invite you to download the app and just ch check out what is possible. And maybe you can provide yourself or your coach with, with your training zones and then you're ready to go. Okay. Thank you very much. Sounds really interesting and sounds really useful. Uh, maybe for somebody, the science in the sports could be boring, but it's definitely helpful. And sometimes you just need to... Uh, admit that the scientific approach to sports uh, power it's useful and it helps you to get better so thank you marcus for your initial speech i will thank remind you. one more time that uh, you will be part of the q a session in the end uh, as well as uh, anybody else so if anybody who is watching and uh, following us can ask the questions for marcus and best side uh, as well use the q a um, button in the bottom of the zoom application so that was uh, marcus nussbaum from uh, best site and uh, now we move on because we have a few more speakers ready to talk to you and now it's uh, body rockets turn body rocket is uh, creating the world's first device to provide real-time direct drag force data for cyclists and triathletes with the accuracy of a wind tunnel the patented technology uk only and usa applied for provides the rider with a real-time aerodynamics measurement collected by sensors uh, on the seat post handlebars and pedals 
which is then beamed wirelessly to Garmin cycle computer. It looks to me Garmin is still important uh, and uh, it has a key role uh, in the next uh, chapter of our webinar as well. But who is the most important here right now is Eric de Gaulier, the CEO of Body Rocket, who will explain uh, more details about uh, Body Rocket. Uh, so, Eric, great to have you here. Uh, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, just uh, clarify the, the, the title of, uh, of my speech there is, uh, was a little bit wrong. So it will be about aerodynamics, uh, not uh, not uh, training zones. Um, if anyone was was uh, uh, hoping to to hear that, but um, yeah, so uh, Body Rocket is working with Christian Blumenfeld and Gustav Eden to help improve their aerodynamics uh, with the company goal of making our system commercially available late next year, so people of all ability levels can can benefit from it. Um, and there's surprisingly little difference between what they're working uh, towards and, and the problems that you'll all be familiar with. Uh, you train for three sports uh, at a time, so time's precious. Uh, being able to integrate those decisions of aerodynamics into your daily training takes away the conflict between uh, trading off uh, training time for aero testing. We'll talk a little bit about our system at the end, but mostly I'll be talking about the importance of aerodynamics more generally uh, today. It's, um, it's often talked about as if it's magical uh, or at least too complex to understand. Uh, it's not simple, uh, but if you understand why it appears complex, it's easier to see a path towards making it simple. Uh, and that's the journey we're gonna gonna go on today. If I can get my slides to work, there we go. Um, so if you take hills out of the equation uh, for now, uh, you can break the pursuit of speed down into to three choices. Uh, you can increase your power output, um, which is the, the vertical axis on the left, and that takes you a little further out, our, our blue curves of, of aerodynamic drag and, and uh, red, our green curve of, of rolling resistance. Um, you can reduce your frictional losses, that's, that's the green curve, um, or you can reduce your aerodynamic losses. Now, we spend almost all of our time trying to improve power. If you think about everything that, that, that you're doing in, in your training and your nutrition, it's all about improving your, your power, your average power over the course of your event. And there's big gains at first, uh, but if you've been doing this for a few years, then you're looking at improvements of, uh, you know, sort of 5% or, or, or less, and that's often uh, with big increases in, in training. Um, so rolling resistance and, and frictional losses aren't big, uh, so the potential for gains there are, are smaller, um, and uh, those are typically solved purely through buying better equipment as well. So if you look at the three things that we can, can work with, then that really comes down to um, uh, aerodynamics. And there we go. Um, so you'll heard plenty of, of stories about aerodynamic gains. Uh, people getting tested for the first time can see gains sometimes, you know, 10% or, or more, although they often doesn't translate to uh, quite the same thing in the race. Uh, most of you won't have done any aero testing though, because it is expensive and it's often difficult to fit into your schedule. Um, so what else can you do? What else are we doing? Well, buying aero equipment like helmets and skin suits can help. Um, but it's kind of a frustrating experience because you don't have any way of knowing how much it's helped. Um, and so you're at the mercy of, of other manufacturers' claims. Um, the alternative is to, to buy more aero equipment for your bike. Um, and that's not a great trade-off either. Your, your bike and everything on it only make up 20% of all your aerodynamic drag. So um, it's still ignoring the biggest potential gains that you can make uh, by getting your, your body more aero. So what can we do about that? Well, first you can celebrate how much better we have it than these guys. It's easy to laugh at them and, and think, well, you know, if, if only they knew the importance of aerodynamics, then they'd ditch those flappy clothing and find a better spot for their spare tire. Actually, though, they did know. This is a plot from the 1896 book Bicycles and Tricycles. And if it looks familiar, it's because it's essentially the same plot as the modern one that I showed you a few slides earlier. We've known about how important aerodynamics are for more than 125 years. Um, we really should have started seeing skin suits and aero helmets in like 1897 and 1898, but we didn't, of course. And, and why? Well, because knowledge by itself isn't always power. So if I know how important aerodynamics is, but I don't have any way of measuring it, then a change in my aerodynamics, there's still not much I can do with that. So the year before this plot came out, there was another scientific discovery that gave us eyes into a different problem. And that was the invention of the X-ray. So broken bones have been around for nearly as long as bones have been around, but in 1895, doctors got a new tool to finally see that break. And so they could see the extent of the damage, they could understand how to reset it properly. And that really changed a doctor's ability to, to do something about that problem. And so you wouldn't have to live with a disfigured arm for the rest of your life. 
Similarly, maps, they've been around for centuries, but they were awfully hard to read until we got GPS and it allowed us to always know where we are. Now we're always at the center of the map and that moves around us and we get lost a lot less. And I don't know about you guys, but I had no idea how cute cats were until the invention of the internet. So how important is aerodynamics? I talked about it in, in sense of the other things that you can use to, to train with. This is another example. I think there's a great visual way to see it. So this is a plot of the world hour record. It goes up and to the right at a fairly steady rate, like many human performance records do, but there's two sections missing from this plot. The first is when cyclists first started using wind tunnels. The first two dots are bikes going into the wind tunnels and the rest of those orange dots are what happened when we stuck the rider on the bike and put that into the wind tunnel. It was so shocking the UCI actually put a stop to it and we went back to trundling along on that steady pace for, the, for a few more decades with those, those extra blue dots you see there. And then finally, a couple decades later, we decided to do it all over again and allow modern aerodynamic positions, which were not, it wasn't the free for all of before, um, but we did it all over again. We used aerodynamics to just make gains that were outsized. If you were increasing your power by this much, people are going to be very suspicious of, of what you're doing. But aerodynamics really does allow these kind of gains. And this, this plot's actually a couple uh, a couple dots old, there's been some changes this year. So those gray dots actually go above the orange dots now and modern positions are in fact the, the fastest we've ever gone on bikes. So how's it all happened? Well, wind tunnels are more available now than they ever were, but they're still pretty inconvenient in the grand scheme of things. They help at the very elite level and they certainly help with those, those records that I was showing you. Field testing, whether that's on a velodrome or a flat stretch of road, that's become more common and easier to do. Now, instead of spending a few hours a year in a wind tunnel, top athletes can spend tens of hours uh, testing positions or equipment. And the more time spent testing, just the faster the learning. And the response times for those testing is, is also dropping. A lot of field tests still require a decent amount of data crunching afterwards um, and, and just uh, having confidence that the, the data that's taken has been good. Um, that takes time and it can be intimidating if you're not handy with physics and, and a spreadsheet. Um, but that's improving as well. So this year we've been out and showing real-time feedback in velodrome testing um, and offering a full analysis, uh, a breakdown of, of the details of that test immediately after it's, it's finished. But all of that, that's still testing. So as an analogy here, it's, it's like having access to the average power for your first five minute interval in a set of 10 intervals. So you don't know what happened during the interval. You only know the average and what happened on the fifth interval when you were starting to, to get tired, but we don't know that either. We just, we got to go out and test five positions and each one of them was a, you know, a five minute test. And that's, that's all we can see about that position. And then we're making a decision on it. Wind tunnels and this whole idea of testing aerodynamics is built on the idea that aerodynamics don't really change when we ride. And that works great for cars, airplanes, that the wind tunnels were designed for, but humans we're squishy. So we change shape when we go hard. We should change shape when we get tired, um, when we hit different terrain. So it's, it's really hard to understand uh, aerodynamics and by these, these little averages, these points in time. What we really need to do is understand it, monitor it all the time, just like we do with power and heart rate. We're also, we're going slow enough as cyclists uh, that changes in our surroundings can have significant changes to our aerodynamics. So it's, it's hard to test in every environment. And that's exactly what you're doing when your testing is your training. And that's where we're going with what Body Rocket is, is doing. Um, because we're the first device that's able to directly measure drag forces, we're capable of uh, giving consistent and fast results over a much broader range of, of conditions um, in really any condition that, uh, that you ride in. So this becomes like a power meter. You put it on your bike and you zero it and, and you go out for a ride. And this is going to usher in a whole new way of thinking about aerodynamics. And with that, you get feedback that helps you make intelligent decisions. So, you know, how close is your average CDA from that bevy of tests you did last Saturday to, to decide on, on your position and your skin suit and your helmet, how close is that to the actual position that you're, you're averaging in, in an event? Um, and of the positions that you've tested, which one's fastest for the course and the conditions that you're going to see this weekend? We talk about aerodynamics of cyclists like it's a single point, but if we were to buy a bike or a set of wheels, you're going to have a, you know, you're going to see that against a range of yaw angles. And we need to be able to look at our own bodies and our aerodynamics in, in a similar way. Um, and just buying it, the, the, all that equipment. So if you're thinking about dropping 400 euro on a new set of funky aero extensions or a, or a skin suit, are they actually faster? Are they faster for you? So being able to test that is, is going to be uh, something that that's, uh, is very important and something that should be available in the very near future. So aerodynamics, it's important. We've known it for a long time. Manufacturers have been doing the best for quite a while now to, to bring you the fastest equipment that they can. 
Um, but it's a really challenging problem. We're all different and we're changing all the time. So it's a really hard uh, target to hit. Um, so right now, uh, a, a product's often built for a Kona or Tour de France winner, and then hopefully it, it works for the rest of us. Um, but the tools that we need to start making personalized choices that work for each and every one of us, they're coming. Uh, we're going to start uh, looking at aerodynamics differently in, in a much more informed way and a more accessible way that should truly democratize aerodynamics. Um, something that's really been the domain of elite athletes for more than 20 years now. So uh, exciting times are coming. Um, it, it's going to bring improvements everywhere from the pro level down to, to dedicated amateurs. Uh, and it should be coming very soon. That's a, hopefully a good point to hand over to Martin and his talk about aero helmets. Mm -hmm. Okay. That was really, really interesting. I was really listening carefully uh, to your speech about the performance and the importance of aerodynamics as well. Really interesting. Thank you, Eric. Uh, sure. Let me remind you that uh, you can ask Eric the questions about the importance of aerodynamics in the final session uh, Q&A of this webinar. Uh, one quick note. If you want to point out who do you wish to answer your question, uh, make a note in your question in the Q&A section in the Zoom application. It would be much easier for us to recognize which one you want to uh, hear uh, the answer from to your question. And it will make uh, us easier to fulfill your wish about the information you want to hear. So that's uh, about Eric as well and all the previous speakers. And now we have a next chapter chapter ahead of us. And that's the performance with an aero helmet closely connected with the previous topic of importance of aerodynamics and the performance with an uh, aero a helmet we will discuss with a representative of Abus company since 1924 Abus provides the good feeling of security worldwide as a German quality manufacturer ensure that products are highly reliable and offer a long service life while being easy to operate in order to meet the growing requirements of private and commercial users. Abus provides a large product range, range of innovative security solutions in the areas of security and the Aero helmets as uh, especially important for us. We have Martin Beckelman, the senior manager, sponsorship and sports marketing. And I think Martin, you can uh, uh, now enjoy your time in the webinar and uh, great time for you to talk uh, after Eric. Uh, correct? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Tomas. Um... I'm super happy, by the way, because what Eric already mentioned fits pretty good to my um, short presentation. Mm -hmm. So, um, of course, I had no experience uh, um, what you what wanted to share, but it's it's really great because it comes directly to my topic. So, what that has aerodynamics to do with the helmets? Of course, everybody knows there are so many TT helmets, and if you look many many years ago. Um, the TT helmets were a really, really long tail. They had a shape like a real long tail. And one definitely very important question um, already Eric was asking for is, is um, the transfer from the pros to the age group or just from me? Yeah. So what is good for a super pro rider or pro triathlete does not really mean that it's really good for me. Yeah. So um, second the type of helmets is so different um, just to look into some details. If you need a helmet for a prologue or for a, the start of a big race, you are super fast and you don't care about ventilation, the fitting, it really doesn't matter. It's just, you just need to be fast and you will be, yeah, it's a dynamic situation, but you will be more or less super stable on the bike. But on a TT race, or um, you have another average speed, um, but definitely the conditions between uh, a TT race or a triathlon or a team time trial are completely different. Yeah. What I want to say is um, the helmets you need and the aerodynamic needs for a helmet is, is very different. And a helmet that is good for, let's say, 56K or 58Ks per hour 
let's say for an hour record uh, um, a race or competition is completely different than a helmet for, let's say for the, an age group a triad lead um, who might have an average of uh, 35 Ks per hour, 38 Ks, depending on the topography and the conditions. Plus, now we are talking to triad leads. Um, of course, every brand needs to find um, the best transfer to make the, let's say the core, what is relevant for the helmet. So a triad lead in, um, has so many complex influences, how to perform with the helmet. And it's not only about aerodynamics. Of course, aerodynamics is super relevant. And we are talking about top level aerodynamic helmets. That's, that's not the question. The question is, which type of aero helmet might give me or might help me or support me in, let's say, in, in my maximum performance output. And said that we are, we are on a very um, high level aerodynamic base, um, there are many more features a helmet should have um, to make possible that I can, let's say, give my, my maximum uh, performance. So one thing is definitely the ventilation. So the climate management is, uh, is massive. It's the, so the impact once you're uh, suffering because of the temperature and the helmet is, is massive because we saw so many also pro athletes that just need to abandon because of they were suffering, um, let's say, um, because of the heat. So it, it is massive. And um, when you look into the market, there are many TT helmets uh, or triathlon helmets that have nearly the same shape, the same look. Um, but you can see on some helmets there are there are no vents, yeah, so no ventilation holes here, yeah? and uh, some of them they have some more ventilations like we have here at example, yeah. And the question is of course how relevant is this for for my aerodynamics? That's that's a that's a big and difficult question. Um, what you can do is just to make the test, and of course as a helmet producer or helmet manufacturer. Um, we made hundreds of tests in wind tunnel on track and of course the feedback of our pro athletes. And what I can say is that in the frontal area, what we have here, so the, this, uh, this went here, um, the influence on the aerodynamics was ridiculous. Yeah. So we, we taped it, we covered it completely and the difference were ridiculous. You really, you can forget that. It does not mean that it's the same situation for other kinds of helmets. I'm just talking about our helmets. Yeah? Um, but as we know that the ventilation is, is quite important, you should definitely compare the helmets what, where you feel better. And um, the, the wind, the, there is another reason why you need the ventilation because when the, the wind or the, say the, um, yeah, the wind is getting into the helmet, you need to, to canalize the air to get out. So we have a big outlet here at this helmet, the aero helmet has it in any way. And also at our TT helmet, there is a big outlet here at, at, the, at the back. So one point to let the, the warm air out to, um, to take care of your climate management. And second, for aerodynamics, because if you are not controlling the, um, the, the hot air or the warmed air um, at the back of the, of the helmet, then you will have so many turbulences here and this will reduce your aerodynamics. Long story short, aerodynamic is a, is a critical factor for, for helmets. There is no perfect helmet, but you might find your perfect helmet once you're uh, testing that. And this is uh, to get back to what Eric said. In the field test, you need to see what is my best solution. For um, a um, um, pro athlete that is able to be stable on one position, that's fine, take the most aerodynamic helmet for you. Um, once you have um, a topography um, on a really demanding race, uh, so up and down hilly, and you will maybe not uh, race with 48 cowers, then you need to consider um, if, you're, um, if a real longer helmet and TT helmet is good from these aerodynamic conditions or, or wind conditions, yeah. Um, on, Lanzarote, Hawaii, or um, partially in Challenge Road, um, you will have super hot and sunny conditions 
and you can imagine that once um, the, um, the the climate management of a helmet is really poor, then you will lose some uh, a lot of your performance. You will you will definitely not yet give what you could do. So this is a relevant point, and this is what you cannot test in the in a wind tunnel or in a track test. Yeah, and then if you if you look into different seat positions. So this is just an example, no? so it has nothing to do with your own, with your personal situation. Um, but we are using uh, some really expensive virtual um, wind tunnel software to make as many tests as we can do before we go into some um, uh, development process. But just to share this example, the the positioning of uh, on your hands on the extensions, um, the way where your fingers are, you cannot see it here, but we know it from 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 the test results. Um, the angle of the helmet and all the turbulence is in the back uh, has so many impact on your CDA. And of course, uh, if you measure that on, uh, on, on the different speed levels, you can imagine that we are talking about not only seconds, it's, uh, it's about minutes. Yeah? So this is from an aerodynamic standpoint. Yeah? To coming back to the, um, the transfer, what is relevant for you, maybe um, you, so it, it's me, uh, an example, I cannot have this position on, on 180k, that would be impossible for me. But a pro athlete like Maurice Clavel, he is able to, uh, to hold that position. So this might be a very good solution for him, but maybe not for other uh, athletes. Um, I definitely um, recommend, uh, if you want to perform better, to, to do some um, airwood tests to find the right position on the bike where you really feel good and not starting from a wind tunnel test. So wind tunnel is nice, it's good for the orientation, but very often the issue is to break it down to the practice and then you need to change your positioning again. So maybe from a, um, um, an ergo fit that might, might be a good start and then you can adapt um, more things. Um, Bef what I want to say is before you go into the wind tunnel, you need to consider um, the practical conditions. And uh, so what Eric already said, the, a practical test is the best what you can do. Um, because in the, in, in, in the triathlon race, at example, um, you also have the transition areas. Once you are lost with putting the helmet on and off and you cannot close the buckles, uh, you're losing time. Yeah. Once you're you don't know how to put the visor on, or you want to use glasses, and um, that's what you need to test uh, in advance. It very often comes to the questions: um, How aerodynamic are the glasses or the visor? That's very difficult to answer because it um, um, there are so many helmets in the market where you would lose a lot of aerodynamics once you are wearing just glasses. At our helmets, I can say because we have a very um, small frontal area, the difference between the glasses we are using and the visor is, is very, very small. So what I want to say, you can use what you um, uh, where you feel more comfortable. And, and so this is really not reducing um, the, your aerodynamics. So the changing the positioning and moving the head up and down has more influence on the aerodynamics. Yeah, um, yeah. Many more ideas. Of course, you you should feel good with the helmet. That's what I want to say. Is the helmet should not be the the pain in the ass. Right? Once you have a helmet that is putting here and there and there, it does not make sense. Ideally, you don't think about your helmet. That's one point. And second is you. There are easier things uh, where you can feel the aerodynamics. When you're on the road and let's say maybe on, on a small descent, uh, 50, 60 K, 70 K, and as less sound you are hearing, as better is the aerodynamics. Yeah? So that's, that's not scientific. It's just easy to feel that. So you don't need to go into the wind tunnel. Yeah? Of course, if you are willing to pay some money for the wind tunnel, do that. But I would suggest uh, to make the ergo test before and uh, or, or after, but um, you need to, to feel in the practice what is good for you. And another, um, another point is definitely um, don't lose too much time or to, in, in, in moving your head up and down. Now, of course, you need to relax your neck. That's very often. But I can see um, um, many riders, also pro, uh, pro athletes, um, 
with the long tail helmets. And once they are moving the helmet up and down, they are losing a lot of watts, a lot. Yeah. So if you if you cannot be really super stable on on the bike, which is natural, I would say, uh, take the helmet that fits ideally to your position. So I would say it's you need to be honest to yourself. I, I am a pro like uh, Jan Frodeno, for example, or Maurice Clavel. So guys that can be super stable on uh, five hours, maybe. Or, um, or are you moving a lot or you need to do it because of relaxing a little bit and then make the right choice of the helmet. And once this is uh, done for the aerodynamics, please have in mind the fitting, the weight and the ventilation. And at the end, if you feel happy, then, then it's good. Yeah. So I was not just mentioning that from, from an able standpoint. Of course, we have um, different type, type of helmets and also the same fitting for training and race because the interior design is nearly the same. And also our aero helmet is one of the fastest in the market. That's what I definitely can say. But I will never say that here is the perfect helmet. I can say that in the, in the mixture for you, this might be the perfect solution. And depending on your positioning on the bike, how long are you in which speed level and how are the race conditions? So this is a setup you need to, to find out. And at the end, um, if you feel happy, then you will have the maximum performance. Yeah, that's it. That, that's what I want to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Martin, thank you very much. And it was really interesting to hear something about the helmets and about the uh, behavior of the pros and the hobby athletes. Uh, thank you very much. You will be part of the Q&A session uh, as well as the others. So uh, stay with us, please. Uh, with the previous two speeches, we were discussing especially the aerodynamics features of triathlon. Let's now move uh, into the first discipline and let's discuss a little bit uh, the hydrodynamics uh, with the benefits of wetsuit uh, with uh, Scott Hilster, triathlon coach. Uh, he will be representing the Zone 3 uh, as the world's highest rated triathlon brand. Zone 3 is committed to creating world-class products that embody dedication to the sports we love. Products that will inspire and enable you to achieve your best and maximize your performance. Whether you are a season and professional or just uh, dipping your toe in zone three are committed to supporting you on your journey that's uh, the brief introduction of zone three and we will have more to hear of uh, scott helster the triathlon coach so uh, welcome scott uh, one more time uh, thank you for staying with us and now it's your turn Oh, thank you very much, Thomas. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna cover some stuff on wetsuits and um, some products that Zone Three have on offer uh, and kind of what they they uh, sort of evolved and evolved from. Um, but going back historically, um, Zone Three was founded in 2006 by James Locke, who was an elite um, triathlete that went through university in Loughborough um, and got an engineering degree. He was a national level swimmer and a runner, and obviously that evolved into his elite sort of profile. And in 2006, he had the idea of developing the brand Zone 3. Um, and in 2009, managed to launch that brand. And it is where it is today, world leading in all the products that it does. And is continually looking to um, push the boundaries of what it does. Um, the last two uh, sort of topics we've covered, aerodynamics. It's no different in the water, whether we're sea swimming, pool swimming, lake swimming, or even with river swimming. So hydrodynamics is what we call it in this case. Hydrodynamics is something um, which Zone 3 are really, really trying to push and the materials that we use um, to push the boundaries and get the best for athletes, whether they are age groupers, elite level athletes, or even beginner athletes, or your, your, your um, typical swimmers that like to use it for mental health aspects all year round. Um, Zone 3 have uh, quite a few uh, brands or uh, uh, wetsuits on offer. They have ranges from breaststroke wet, wetsuits all the way up to the Vanquish X, which is their, their top wetsuit, which you'll see most age group swimmers now and elite level swimmers using. So typically the, the materials they use um, range from 0.3 millimetres to 5 millimetres in thickness. 
and these thicknesses in, in uh, materials they use will give you um, better um, buoyancy in the water in certain areas. So uh, an example of this is you might find that five millimeter rubber will be in the chest panel, the main body and potentially the legs for some people to give them the maximum lift in these areas. Now, the top end sort of range of wetsuits is what they're using today. We're using uh, materials like uh, neoprene rubber, which are coated with titanium alloy, which is now giving people an even warmer experience in the water. Um, Yamamoto rubber and Yamamoto bio rubber across the, the range of wetsuits they use as well. I've already spoken about the, the, the sort of materials they're using and the thicknesses that they are using in different areas. And the easiest way for me to describe this is typically therabands, which you get from physiotherapies, sort of sessions that you can go and use um, in exercise. Now, the easiest way for me to describe this is these come as different thicknesses. So now the top end wetsuits, you're starting to see thinner materials in areas that need to move. So ideally the shoulders predominantly. So the wetsuits now have thinner materials in those areas so that there's less restriction against them areas that need to move. So as you swim, you're not fighting a force that's going to fatigue you and your body out. So again, we're using the thinner materials around the shoulder areas specifically um, to enable you to swim better, further, longer and faster in most cases. Wetsuits are designed to keep us warm in the water. Here in the UK, it tends to be pretty seasonal, uh, as in when we can swim, typically spring to autumn because it gets quite cold. Um, so, you know, the, the zones we have a wetsuit, which is a thermal wetsuit, which allows you to swim uh, all year round in some cases, or push you an extra month in UK weather uh, because it, the way it's lined and the materials that are used for that, it's a warmer wetsuit. Swimmer mobility is massive within all swimmers and ultimately most triathletes out there tend to be um, or don't come from a swimming background. So that tends to be the area of weakness and the area they're looking to make most advantages in. Hence, most triathletes will look for a better wetsuit to give them maximum performance they can get within their swim, whether that's pool swim, lake swim, sweet swim, um, leisure swims. Um, so this is the improved swim we're looking for from that uh, and ultimately wetsuits will look to correct swimming weaknesses for instance as well so typically um, most triathletes sort of will argue the fact that they suffer with sinking legs and potentially this is down to their body position in the water and it can have be in multiple factors that this happens um, the way they breathe not breathing properly the way they are um, holding oxygen in their lungs and they're not exhaling it while their head's in the water. Uh, effectively, your legs can start to sink with that. But the, the materials um, and the wetsuits that Zone 3 are offering will correct your body position in the water and give you a better all-round swim um, during them races or training. So that's kind of where we're looking at in the wetsuits and the benefits that they can give you. But moving on to things we need to look at that are really important for wetsuits when you're purchasing a wetsuit and when you're putting wetsuits on specifically is things like the fit of a wetsuit. Every single person out there, they're, um, everyone's got different shapes. Uh, everyone comes in different shapes and sizes from males to females. So it's really important to find the wetsuit that fits you properly. And typically when you look for a wetsuit, you might find it when you're looking through the sizing chart that you could fall within two or three categories um, of a size of wetsuit. And this is normally around to the, the, uh, the weight of a person, the height of a person, your, your chest size. So you have to narrow this down by looking through sizing charts to find out what wetsuit effectively will fit you best. And ultimately you could fit into, into two categories in some cases. So if you do have the opportunity to try a wetsuit on, I'd really recommend that that's something that you look to do because uh, that's how you will find the best wetsuit for you uh, at that time. But one thing we commonly see in a lot of the expos that we do and the events that we partake in um, uh, is how people actually put wetsuits on. And a lot of people out there don't actually take the time to put the wetsuits on correctly. Now, they look to, to put them on as fast as they can, get to the swim start and off they go. But typically... 
they don't put them on. People like to think that the wetsuit cuffs or the wetsuit legs have to be at the full extent of the limb. When they don't, because ultimately our feet and our hands um, are not the heavy part of our body. It's the, you know, the, 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 the main body uh, and our legs is where we're looking for the lift. So we really need to ensure that we're taking the time to put wetsuits on and we're pulling the neoprene up, up the legs uh, as far as we can um, so that there's no air pockets in the groin area or in the armpits specifically. If there is um, air pockets in the armpits or the groin, that tends to then lead to the athletes feeling cold because there's no, or the water themselves are going between the wetsuit. It tends to create a flushing sensation. So the wet, the water that's going in there is not holding and it's not warming up between your body and the neoprene. It's continuously flushing through and that will, will make you feel cold and could have a negative impact on your swim. So with wetsuits, make sure you put them on, make sure there's no air pockets um, in the armpits and the groin. Don't be, you know, don't be disheartened or don't think that you have to have the extent of the wetsuits to the full extent of the limbs. If they're halfway up your calf, but there's no air pockets in the groin, then that's a good thing where you want, because that's only where we need the lift. Neoprene is really fragile. Uh, and again, typically we see this all the time from people putting new wetsuits on, brand new wetsuits out the box. They don't take their time to put them on. And commonly people pull the wetsuits too quickly and they will tear or you'll end up with a nail mark or a nail, nail rip in the actual neoprene themselves. Um, I personally have found that if, I, if you push the ne neoprene down with your thumbs, it then creates a ripple which you can pinch and pull rather than just pulling up with the nails, which obviously will, will result in um, damage to the wetsuits. Neoprene is really, really temperamental. It's quite fragile. So please do take your time when putting wetsuits on. Ultimately, you want to spend more time getting the wetsuit on correctly to give you that better performance, that better buoyancy in the water, that improved swim, uh, and, and to correct any weaknesses that you may have uh, in your swimming technique. So take the time to put the wetsuit on. And obviously, once you come out of the swim at the other end, it should come off pretty quickly anyway, um, and then obviously on to your next disciplines of the sport. Wetsuit care is really important. Um, you know, rubber, neoprene, it can all be damaged, especially if you're using them in, in sort of salt water or in chlorines in some cases, depending on the swim pools that you're swimming in. So you really need to take care of these wetsuits, you know, during your training and racing, um, or if you're racing as soon as you can afterwards. So make sure that you flush them through with clean, clean water, fresh water. Um, typically, I like to take mine into the shower and you can flush that through. And then I generally let that dry naturally, not in sunlight. Um, and I don't like to put mine on, on certain types of hangers because certain types, especially wire hangers, certain types of hangers can actually misshape the actual rubber. Um, and over time, obviously, that will degrade the performance of what you're trying to get from the wetsuit. So really do take care in flushing wetsuits through afterwards. Let them dry naturally out the way of direct sunlight. Um, typically, turn them inside out to start with. Let them dry that way and then turn them around the other way and then stow them away in the box if you still keep it or somewhere that's away from direct sunlight. Taking wetsuits off can be another area that we need to look at. Um, again, as we mentioned, neoprene is quite, um, quite uh, fragile. Um, normally in a race, people have a, a watch on, on their wrist for their, their swim time, so they can obviously record that data for later on and during the race itself. And typically, if you pull your wetsuit off over the wrist, they can catch and they can tear in that area as well. So really do take, take care of sometimes when you're taking them off and practice that element of putting wetsuits on and taking them off in, in your training. It's really important to do so. So quick overview there. We've covered just some, some hydrodynamics and buoyancy, some warmth in the water and some general care on wetsuits themselves. As I've previously mentioned, Zone 3 have got some fantastic wetsuits up out there from wetsuits from, you know, their banquet section to the top end all the way down the scale to people that are quite new to the sport and even people that like to swim all year round in thermal wetsuits and even breaststroke wetsuits on offer. That's it from me. Thank you, Thomas. 
Thank you, excellent Scott. That was Scott Hulster, triathlon coach, talking to us about the benefits of using wetsuits. A small change, uh, comparing to previous speeches about the aerodynamics, this one was about the hydrodynamics. So uh, Scott is uh, still here with us uh, for the Q and A session. In the end, uh, don't forget to ask your question. Do you, uh, using the Q&A button in the bottom line of the Zoom application. And we have one uh, final speech uh, ready uh, for you. Uh, at least I hope it's ready. Uh, there's a huge racer uh, taking part in uh, this webinar. And it's Peter Wabroshek, who has been talking to you about the approach uh, to training. And he has a few more words to say about the nutrition as a fourth discipline of triathlon peter great to still have you here uh, if i take the topic nutrition as a fourth discipline of triathlon uh, when i do the commentary of the triathlon races and when i'm in the triathlon and uh, environment i usually uh, hear the motto that the transition area is the fourth discipline of triathlon and now we have a nutrition as the fourth discipline of triathlon so you think the correct nutrition uh, in the pre-race and the race time are really uh, so important that uh, you want to call it as the fourth discipline of triathlon yeah definitely nutrition would be one of the fourth disciplines of the triathlon but if we take it uh, really carefully into our accounts so we would end up with decathlon instead of triathlon <laughs> because as nutrition can be the fourth discipline the same we can say about transition areas or transitions how to get quickly from water to the bike and from bike to efficient running uh, another fourth discipline might be considered strength training uh you know relaxation would be another one uh, all kinds of recovery from sessions uh, logistics how to put all the equipment uh, together we've just listened about aero helmets and wetsuits that's just a very small part of the whole equipment every triathlete needs uh, for successful racing on the top level so we would end up with decathlon but let's talk about nutrition for now as we announced that uh, once again, I'll, we are running back on time, so I'll have just a quick uh, overview of the main things, so what to concentrate on with nutrition, and uh, if you have any specific question uh, containing your, what you want to specifically know about nutrition, put it into Q&A, and we will do our best to get back to it in a Q&A section. Uh, the most important thing uh, in nutrition, which was mistakenly uh, described many, many mm -hmm. times in the past few years, would be that we definitely need all nutri nutrients. We need carbohydrates, we need fats, we need protein. All the diets uh, trying to force, up, force us uh, quit on one of the nutrients, uh, they might work for someone, they definitely do don't work for most of us. So make sure that your body, which is uh, training hard, is getting all the nutrients it needs. Uh, proper ratio of carbos, proteins and fats. Uh, generally try to eat healthy, which is uh, easily uh, described as having a lot of fruits, vegetables, uh, whole meal products, all kinds of meats. Uh, just make sure that your body can pick all the needed nutrients from great variety of food. Make sure to eat accordingly to your energy expenditure. Uh, we can see, uh, at, for example, with Christian Blumenfeld, that you don't need to be super skinny to be fast and very effective. Uh, sometimes weight loss also means a loss of power and loss of uh, your ability to raise heart. So make sure that you are at a healthy weight, which can be described as a weight which you can easily sustain over the whole year, not a weight that you diet to before some major race. And then two weeks later after that race, you are five kilograms more. So try to keep your weight stable at a healthy level. Make sure that your body has everything it needs. Uh, if you need to lose some weight, it's all about uh, proper income to outcome. Uh, ratio so try to lose as uh, 
not not fast maybe half a kilogram per two weeks something like uh, one to two kilograms per month that might be a healthy body weight loose if it's faster you it usually kicks back on you unless you are 50 kilograms overweight of course and very important uh, section in the nutrition is uh, timing in in your day-to-day uh, life in your training life make sure that you don't eat uh, for about two hours before your training session to have everything uh, digested and your body can then put all the all the energy into your training session without still having food in your stomach uh, everything's digested you can start with the fats because you don't have too much sugars uh, flowing into your blood uh, at the time when you start your exercise start with proper warm-up to get your fats uh, running and as the session goes on if you need to go hard that day go hard after proper warm-up and after not eating for two hours before the session on the other hand after the session the best way to do it is to eat straight away as soon as you can uh, you don't have to uh, use specific mix for uh, quick replenishment if you have enough time after your session to go for a proper meal I usually have uh, some fruits uh, ready right after the session to replenish both uh, some natural phytonutrients and uh, uh, the sugars and uh, also a lot of uh, fluids. And then after shower and maybe quick stretch, I go for a normal meal with all the nutrients in it, including fats and proteins. Uh, so that would be for timing uh, for race day scenario the most important thing is to know exactly what you are you going to eat and drink have everything tested at similar intensity in similar weather conditions and uh, at sim- at similar amounts so if if you are planning on using a certain kind of gel because it might be provided by a race organizer for a race you are preparing for make sure to order those gels plenty of time ahead and go for a similar intensity session being it run or bike and just have those two gels every hour and make sure that it sits well with your body even the flavor can make a big difference if you are really sensitive Uh, if it doesn't work make sure to test other gels other uh, nutrients other sports drinks other energy bars definitely test bananas that's a perfect uh, sports nutrition for on course uh, for t- both for racing and training and usually those are available at almost every race just make sure that you have a list of uh, things you can eat during your training sessions and racing ses- uh, races and make sure you put everything which work well for you into first column this works for me every time and then there might be another column. This might working be working for me in a very hot conditions or in very cold conditions, for example. Or for shoulder races, this is okay for me. And then third column, this is definitely not sitting well for me when I'm racing hard. And if you have this very easy, uh, easily created table, including basically your own experience, how your body reacted to uh, what you've put into it, under different conditions and situations it's very easy to plan your nutrition you should be no uh, you should also know how much carbohydrates you can uh, get through your stomach at a race pace for someone like a small lady it may be as as low as 40 50 grams for someone like me 80 plus kilograms male which very highly trained stomach it may be well over 100 grams per hour so make sure you 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 know your numbers from ideally from your own experience and then it's easily to count uh, the mixture of nutrients or things you use during your bike portion and run portion of race based on your own experience so uh, i would say this is very fast <laughs> uh, let's say mixture of information on nutrition and if you want to ask anything specific uh, feel free to do it through Q&A session we will do our best to answer yeah Peter thank you really briefly but full of uh, interesting information as usual thank you very much for that 
Uh, it was Peter Vabroshek uh, talking about the correct nutrition uh, during the race and the pre-race strategy as well. And that's all for the official part of this webinar. And let me now start the Q&A session with the, your tips, with your questions. Uh, we have the first one asked uh, by the uh, Dmitris Vladimirovs. Thank you for joining us, Dmitris. Uh, his question is, triathlon is a endurance sport. Is it wise to have hard interval trainings in training calendar? Uh, I would say it's a question for Peter. Do you agree? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh... Let's see, it's uh, definitely triathlon is endurance sport. And it might also, you might think that uh, in that case, uh, only easy endurance training sessions is all you need. But if you want, and it's fine, if you do triathlon for fun and for healthy reasons, and you don't really mind uh, what place you finish it at, at the finish line. But if you want to improve, and beat the guys who's beaten you uh, previous time if you want to really get your PR down and uh, improve your position you have to include some faster training into your training calendar because that's something which gets your body out of the uh, let's say homeostasis it gets you tired and it forces your body through the resting phase of, of your week uh, to improve and get ready for a higher intensity so uh, getting faster intervals at uh, speeds which are far or uh, effort which is higher uh, higher and faster than your race effort definitely makes sense because uh, as you are building your overall ability to go hard and fast uh, it also gets the percentage of your race pace and race effort lower and lower so when you start to feel at the lower intensities uh, more comfortable and you you can increase your endurance pace as well mm -hmm. thank you very much hope you're satisfied Dmitris, with the answer of uh, legendary peter Vabroshek. Uh, another question uh, which is anonymous um, asked by anonymous attendee uh, and the question is do you think it is possible to go for a long distance triathlon without any previous experience and this question is specifically for peter again uh it's definitely possible and i've seen many cases of uh, uh those who tried uh it's not advisable uh even though some of those guys and girls who did her their first uh, triathlon and was long distance uh, successfully managed to finish it. Uh, some of them couldn't walk for a week and maybe even got injured. If you want to be really successful and you don't go for just one long distance triathlon in your life, it's definitely better to start with some short distance triathlons and for many, many reasons. First of all, you gain very important experience from actually transitioning from swim to bike and bike to run. Uh, you can test your race nutrition without a uh, huge penalty in case it doesn't work. Because if you find out in a sprint triathlon that mm -hmm. the sports drink or Olympic distance triathlon either, that the sports drink or gel doesn't work for you at the race pace, uh, you can still finish the race uh, reasonably. One, the same for if your bike shoes are not fine for 180 kilometers. If your running shoes are not fine for marathon, uh, you know, all, all this experience is very costly if you find out in the middle of your first long distance triathlon and you end up walking for 10 hours. Uh, so definitely, uh, at least I would advise to start with uh, two to three sprint triathlons, maybe three to four Olympic distance triathlons, then couple, maybe even more uh, 70.3 distance triathlons before attempting to go first Ironman distance, full Ironman distance or challenge race at a full distance, uh, just to know what you are going into and make sure that uh, you don't double uh, the effort when coming from uh, the half distance to full distance. It's, it's like triple, triple that uh, given the energy expenditure and training requirement. So it's possible but definitely not advisable. I did my first uh, full distance triathlon in 1999. 
after being in a short distance triathlon for 10 years. And it definitely paid off. Mm -hmm. It means you recommend to do the, some small steps and work on it continuously to get better result uh, in the first ever long distance triathlon experience, if I understand correctly. Yeah, yeah, you, defin you should definitely gain a lot of experience, test all the equipment, test all your pacing, uh, you know, enjoy the atmosphere of a race, because that's something which is completely different to any kind of training session you can do. And uh, having all those people around you at long distance triathlons, we are often talking about hundreds and thousands of people around you. That's another thing you need to experience and to know how to, you know, tackle it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Uh, you are the busiest guy in the Q&A session. And the third question is uh, for you as well, I would say. Uh, Jakub uh, Wurzel is asking, what is the ratio between cardio and tra training? Do you recommend to do also training sessions such as maximum strength? If yes, when and how much? Uh, that's a great question. I didn't talk a lot in the first training section about strength training, but it's very important. I do it about twice a week for most of the year and most of the, my career. Uh, the main thing with strength training, uh, it definitely takes time away from swimming, cycling and running. If you are, if you are, uh, you know, going to work and have your some also family obligations and you are very limited in your amount of time you can spend training so if your overall training time is up to 10 hours a week i really believe that the, you can spend those 10 hours more effective uh, purely swimming cycling and running to get the best triathlon result uh, maybe with expect exception on working on your core which is uh, doable in maybe two times 10 minutes per week maybe in some time which is not uh, possible to use for swimming cycling or running but once you get more time and you are more into triathlon over those 10 hours, you can definitely put in two weightlifting sessions uh, into your week. The older you are, the more important it is for maintaining uh, your ability to go hard and fast and, and long and keep yourself uh, prone against the injury. That's one of the main uh, most important reasons for strength training. And I definitely promote to go with uh, maximum power, maximum strength, strength uh, with the high weights and long, uh, low amount of repeats. But uh, you need to work toward that, towards that to make sure that your lifting technique is uh, really good and uh, you uh, load it with the weights over a long time before getting to really maximum strength. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, we have, uh, one more question. We have a few more questions. The next one is, uh, from, uh, Matej, uh, Runeler. The question is, let's say I'm planning to use Ruby for next uh, four or five months for the 2023 season prep before it goes, uh, on the road. What is the best way to utilize it? Shall I first start with some slow pace, low watts ADC trainings and increase slowly the effort or full speed is okay. Let's say once per week ADC uh, doing try since 2014. So not a rocky. The body is used to some efforts. Thanks. Uh, who wants to answer yeah. these questions, guys? I guess it goes to to me, to Ruby. Perfect. <laughs> but in general, the the answer for that is not so much about Ruby, I think, but it's about how what's your training plan, right? So if what what how you plan to start with your training, if if uh, it should be uh, like full speed or not, what uh, Ruby can help you with is uh, probably the route you choose. So if you we have different profiles, so if you want to go really flat routes uh it's possible if you want to go go a bit into into the into uphills also possible but i cannot say because we are not you know we are not a training plan application there are different different players on the market so if you combine this training plan with the roots on the ruby then you have ideal training plan 
Yeah, if I can add to that question, uh, it was uh, generally answered at the end of the first 10 minute uh, section when I talked about uh, going long first, building some base, and then going hard later on if when the body is already adapted to uh, basic endurance. Uh, but as uh, Mate is uh, talking about him being in triathlon since 2014, and being experienced triathlete, uh, it it really depends on ho on his uh, let's say adaptation to base training. If that's already done, and this he still has the next four to five months uh, before his season starts, he can already start with some uh, harder sessions, interval sessions, or even uh, use uh, some kind of race on Ruby once a week. That's all fine. The most important thing is that it sits with his uh, plan structure towards his first race. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Clara. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Uh, another question, another anonymous uh, attendee is asking, what is the advantage of uh, measuring results when training? I would say, again, question for Peter. Yeah, it might be a question for me if we are talking about uh, measuring uh, maybe lactate, heart rate, cadence, stuff like that. Uh, but I think that the question came uh, when uh, Eric was talking about body rocket and it might be measuring results of CDA. So uh, I reply from the point of training. Uh, it definitely makes sense to measure all different variables when you are doing your training because it gives you feedback uh, to find out how you felt after the session. Maybe it felt too easy and uh, it should have been harder. So when you check what your heart rate was, what your pace, what age was, and you can adjust your next session next week, ideally with cooperation with your uh, coach. So this, uh, it's a big advantage measuring all kinds of variables through training sessions from a training uh, point of view. And uh, let's see what it does with CDA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah, um, so right now, certainly aerodynamics is, is thought about as, as a testing kind of thing. You go and you find your CDA um, and that's it. And and um, then, then you're done. Um, but as I was talking about in, in when I was, Given the presentation, if you were to buy a, a bike or a set of wheels, um, you would be looking at a plot of CDA versus yaw, and you would see how the the that device performs across that range. Um, you rarely hear athletes talked about in that way, and it's just because of the time and cost of, of doing that is is so prohibitive. So very few athletes will actually know that, but it's just as important. Um, and so if you um, can be using all of your training sessions to be building out that profile, you're just going to get a much better understanding of your of your aerodynamics and that helps you make choices i mean uh, if you've got a race that's predominantly crosswinds uh, i would expect that you're going to be choosing different uh, um, equipment and possibly different position um to to optimize your your speed there in your aerodynamics um there's also the the research is preliminary because the tools are still quite new um but there's uh some research out there that's showing um, that if you have feedback on your aerodynamics in a, a race um, then you can be one and a half to three percent more aerodynamic and that's just the reality of that our bodies are, are changing all the time. Um, and that is very preliminary research. over so very, very short periods of time. I think we would all think that our positions probably do change over the course of an event. We fatigue. Um, uh, our ability to, to hold a position is, is uh, you know, is finite. Um, and if you haven't chosen the right position in particular by the end of the race, um, maybe coming out of that position, um, or you certainly may have lost a lot of your ability to generate power in that position. And so the uh, the ability to to understand your aerodynamics um, in that context of a, a full a full workout and event um, is uh, requires uh, you know uh, just monitoring uh, all time and being able to analyze it. If you look at power, it's it's sort of the same way. You could train to power in the 1980s or 1990s. You just went into a, a lab and hopped on a Monarch ergometer and you got a power number. Um, maybe some Olympians were doing that, but it wasn't making a huge difference to their training. That's basically what a wind tunnel is right now. It's a point in time. It's a snapshot. Uh, and, and because we're changing all the time, what we really need is a tool that allows us to monitor and react to our aerodynamics and, and the environment around us uh, at all times. Okay, great. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for your answer. Uh, another question. Uh, does aerodynamic feature have sense for newbies? 
uh, as well. Another anonymous question, but I would say this is a definite question for Martin. Yeah, oh, um, thanks for thanks for the question. I would say yes, um, because it's when it comes to aerodynamics. Of course, it's a question of, about how how fast you are, but we are not talking about 20 k's or 25 k's. Huh? And independent, if you are 30 k's, 35 or 45 k's in, in in the race, aerodynamic is relevant. And if you break it down to the material that you would need. It is then just a question which material is good for my maximum performance and then to come back to my presentation it's a question if you need just an aero helmet with a good ventilation yeah or a mid tail helmet or long tail helmet or whatever fits perfect in terms of aerodynamic ventilation fitting and so on yeah? so make the best choice but aerodynamic or an aero helmet definitely is a very good decision yes Okay, thank you, Martin. Thank you for your answer. And we have uh, time for uh, one more question. Uh, let me pick uh, one of the remainings. Uh, let's choose the one asked by Alan. Uh, it's a question for Peter as well, uh, but it doesn't matter. Uh, so, Peter, since you can't eat while swimming, that's obvious, how soon before the start and how soon after T1 should you eat carbs and how much should you try to catch up for not eating uh, while swimming? Okay, so when swimming, we can't definitely eat. Sometimes we, we have so-called Australian exit in the middle of the swim, um, usually for a full distance triathlon. You can have an energy drink maybe midway through the swim, but that's not really important because uh, everybody should be tapered for major races. That means that you are fully loaded with uh, glycogen and uh, pre-race meal, usually breakfast. And uh, it's important, actually, most, most important thing is to start the swim at proper intensity to kind of, if you are talking full distance triathlon, to kind of start your fat metabolism without any carbos taken in through the swim, which should be ideal for later on to keep your glycogen for cycling and running as most as, as much as possible. So what I do is I usually advise to have some gel maybe 15 minutes before the swim start as you go for a warm up. It doesn't mix uh, too much with your uh, fat metabolism if you start to exercise immediately. And then straight after you exit the swim, as soon as, soon as you can start with your regular uh, carbohydrate intake, what I do is I actually put one of the gels into my pocket inside my wetsuit. So when I exit the water, I pull down the top of the wetsuit and I have that gel before I even reach T1, where it's usually possible to splash it with water or I can do it with my own water in my T1 bag. And then I keep the schedule I planned for, in my case, roughly 100, case of, uh, 100 grams of carbohydrates every hour. And it doesn't make sense to catch up for not eating through the swim because your limitation, in my case, 100 grams, it may be 60 grams for you or any other number which you need to test first. Uh, it's it's the limit. The limit is your ability to get those carbohydrates through your stomach and to be able to utilize those. So whatever your ability is, just use it to its full potential, whatever can be taken through your stomach without getting you bloated or any other problems, use that because that's a big advantage. That's one of the reasons I think uh, why uh, current pros on uh, full distance triathlon are so much faster than previous generations is that they really take advantage of getting as much nutrition through their systems as they can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, all of you guys. Uh, for the remaining questions, you can uh, contact the social media networks of Ruby and they will try to do their best to answer your questions. So thank you very much. And I would like to thank all the speakers for joining us today. It was uh, Peter Wabroszek, the multi-triathlon champion. Peter, thank you very much. Thank you. 
Uh, we had uh, Marcus Nussbaum, the CEO, founder and head of athlete development, talking about the new technologies in training, representing Best Site Company. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. Uh, as well, Eric de Gaulier, the CEO of Body Rocket, uh, talking to us uh, about the importance of aerodynamics. Thank you, Eric, so much for your speech and for your answers as well. Thank you. It's been an interesting hour. It's been more than our Eric, <laughs> definitely more than our. Uh, but uh, you're Time flies when you're right. It's been really yeah. interesting. Uh, thanks to you and thanks to Martin Beckelman, the senior manager, sponsorship and sports marketing of Abus, talking to us about uh, performance with an Ira helmet. Thanks to you, Martin, as well. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Uh, Scott Hilster, triathlon coach, uh, had a speech about the benefits of wetsuits representing Zone 3. Thank you, Scott. No, thank you, everyone, and good luck in all your future endeavors. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, uh, the only lady among the men, Clara Cherna, representing Rovi. Thank you, Clara, for your speech. And thank you especially for organizing this Rovi Triathlon Fall Fest. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone. On behalf of Rovi, uh, happy to have you in. And I just wanted to remind you that this is not the last event of the Triathlon Fall Fest. We have two more to come. Uh, first of them is uh, today group ride. We are starting in 20 minutes on Challenge Shamorin Championship ride. Uh, so this is the one you can join. Uh, also with a Zoom link that you can ask questions to the group leader, Andre Kubo. And then we have a cherry on the top for tomorrow from 10 a.m. We have a Challenge Road with, uh, as I said, 11 pro athletes. So you can you can join tomorrow morning the real race. It's not a group ride. It will be tough. It will be racing. So uh, feel free to join and enjoy. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Clara. Peter will be among the athletes racing the Challenge Road tomorrow. Right, Peter? Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward yeah. for that. I'll be either trying to comment a little bit the feelings from the course. Looking for you, forward to have you there again, Magnus Ditlev and, and other shining stars. And I will be more than happy to guide you through the studio of the live stream. Uh, another wonderful uh, session with the Ruve Triathlon Fall Fest. Thank you very much, all of you guys, for joining this first ever of its kind webinar uh, for the Triathlon Fall Fest. I hope you have enjoyed uh, previous, I don't know, more than 100 minutes it was really long but still interesting so thank you very much and uh, follow the social medias of our partners and so follow the social medias of Ruve as the organizer of triathlon fall fest online thank you and see you tomorrow uh, during the live stream of data for the challenge rot have a great evening thank you bye 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 thank you bye